My name is Keith Rucker. Um, got a little project going on out here right now working on, uh, on my lathe. Uh, this lathe that we have out at the Georgia Museum of Agriculture is an old Lodge and Shipley 16-inch uh, Model X uh, lathe. Very good lathe. It's actually seen very little use. It was uh, bought by uh, the Savannah River plant uh, back in the 50s. Uh, the machine was made in 1953 and the museum acquired it back in the 1980s uh, off of government surplus and, and it doesn't look like it saw a whole lot of use out of the, out of the uh, Savannah River plant and really in the I guess 25-30 years that it's been here at the museum it's, it's also really seen very little use. Most of that time it's just kind of set in the shop unused. Um, the chuck, the three-jaw chuck that is on this, uh, I believe is original to the machine. I have no reason not to believe that. Uh, but one of the aggravating things that I've had with this chuck, because ever since I've started using it, is that there's a good bit of run out in it. Now every three-jaw chuck that you have is going to have a small amount of run out. Hopefully it's only a thousandth or two, uh, but depending on the chuck you can have a lot of run out. This chuck right here, uh, when I turn this, I got an indicator set up on here it's actually reading about 17 thousandths uh, run out on it, which is uh, way beyond uh, what I consider acceptable. Uh, so anytime I've used this three-jaw chuck, um, it's pretty much is when I'm, I'm chucking something up, I'm turning a lot of metal off of it, and I, I can't take the part out and put it back in there and get it running anywhere close to true again. So I've been somewhat limited in being able to use this chuck. In fact, if you've seen a lot of my videos, uh, I've got a four-jaw scroll chuck uh, that I use a lot of times. Uh, I, I bought a four-jaw scroll chuck for, for turning square stock, uh, where all four jaws move in and out at the same time, like a three-jaw chuck. Uh, it's not a four-jaw that, that they all move independently, like most people think of with a four-jaw chuck. But because uh, that's a newer chuck and it runs a lot truer, a lot of times I've just been using that four jaw chuck because I can chuck something up in there and it's within a couple of thousandths, uh, which is acceptable in a lot of cases. So today's task that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, to true this chuck up to get it running back true again. And the way that we're gonna do that is we're gonna come in here and we're gonna grind the inside of the jaws uh, so that they are running true. Um, this is something I have never tried to do before. I, I have seen a lot of posts on the internet about it. I've even seen a few videos on YouTube where people have done something similar to this. And uh, after thinking about it, actually uh, I saw a, a video that Keith Finner did not long ago where he was a uh, uh, machining some soft jaws uh, for a project that he was doing and had to machine those soft jaws and you know it kind of clicked. I said hey I can kind of use a very similar procedure to him that he used to uh, to get this truck truck running true again. When people think about grinding the inside diameter of a chuck the the thing that I've heard a lot of people say is I oh, will just open the chuck up run a grinder up in there and presto you're done. The problem with that is, is that in order to do this properly, you have to put tension on these jaws, pushing them out like you would be when you tighten up the chuck. Uh, the reason is, is as you can see here, looking at the indicator, you know, we've got about 18 thousandths of play in this particular uh, jaw on this chuck. Just the play inside there where the scroll goes in there and engages those teeth, there's a little bit of room. There has to be. So if we were to just come over here and, and run a grinder up through there and true those, those uh, jaws up without putting tension on the jaws, uh, you're going to make a problem maybe even worse than what it was to begin with. I kind of suspect that that may have been what happened to this chuck, that somebody tried this uh, without doing it properly years ago and may have messed it up worse than what it is because I noticed that my air in there is about the same, uh, my run out is about the same as what I've got uh, uh, in, in play in these, in these jaws. So let me show you how I'm going to put the tension on there. So this is how I'm, I'm putting the tension on these jaws. And again, this is a, um, an idea that I kind of adapted from something that Keith Finner did in one of his videos. Uh, I've been 
this is something I've been wanting to do now for months and I've, I've really just kind of been trying to come up with the best way to do exactly this. I knew I needed to put the tension on there. I knew I needed to use a ring of some kind, uh, but I just wasn't happy with how to do it. And I saw Keith Finner do his video and I said, aha, that's how I can do mine uh, using a similar approach. So uh, I have seen, uh, looking on the internet of some other folks, they actually will put something on here and put the tension coming out so that they're gripping it on the outside of these jaws and pull the jaws out. And I suppose that will work. That will take the slop out, but you could have different wear on either side of that worm gear in there. And I really feel better about this where the jaws are compressing in just like they would normally do uh, when you're tightening a piece down in the chuck. So the, what I did here was there was these cap screws going in the top here holding these, these in and there's a longer cap screw in the front. I left the cap screw in the front putting tension down. These are held in place, they're keyed in place, they're very tightly machined. Uh, just one screw in there is, is putting plenty of pressure on there. Then I took a bolt and screwed in the other side so it was just sticking out and I'm able to come in here and actually tighten it on this bolt. So the bolt is pulling all the, the slop out of this. Of course there is no play in this at all. That is tightened down and uh, now my, my, my jaws and my chuck all have tension on them just like I was clamping down on a piece of, of metal inside. So now I can come in here with my, uh, uh, my grinder, my uh, tool post grinder uh, and using an internal uh, grinding bar on it I can come in here and I can grind the inside of these um, of these uh, pads using my grinder. This is my tool post grinder. Uh, it's a South Bend grinder that I purchased some time ago. You've probably heard me talk about it in other videos. Um, it's not really designed for this lathe, but again, I uh, made a little adapter plate that it mounts on, and I've made it work for this lathe. It's actually made to put a grindstone right here for doing outside grinding, but I knew I wanted to do an inside grinding job on this job, so I made an arbor that extends it out to let me go inside that chuck and grind the inside. Uh, the arbor extension here was my last video. I did that uh, earlier today, and um, if you're interested in seeing how I, I made that, uh, you can watch that. It's a separate video. Um, but I've got this set up now, and the very first thing you always want to do whenever you're putting a tool post grinder or, uh, or doing any precision grinding for that matter is you want to dress the wheel. Now I've made this arbor to run as true as I possibly could but uh, there's always again there's going to be a certain amount of run out in that so I'm just simply going to turn this on. I have a diamond bit uh, chucked up here in the lathe just using a little adapter to put it at 90 degrees. So we'll turn this on and I'm going to come in here and just barely Barely touch right there. All right. And I'm just going to feed in about a thousandth of an inch, just enough to go across there. And you can see it as you're going, making a nice fresh cut across that grinder. You also notice that I have put down a lot of cloth and stuff underneath my my grinder here, I'm trying to keep it as clean as possible, keep as much of this grinding dust off of the ways of my machine because that can get in here and cause wear on my lathe and I sure don't want to do that. So I've got a good uh, cut, a good fresh dressed wheel now. It's uh, ready to go. Um, so we'll go ahead and take the uh, diamond dresser out and get it set back up for grinding. We're about ready to start grinding here. I did want to just mention um, this ring that I have in here. This is just a steel ring. Um, it was actually a, a piece of metal that I had lying around the shop that was uh, more or less like that already. I just put it in the lathe and trued it up. Um, it was actually a piece of scrap left over from another job. Uh, I did put it in here and clean up the outside diameter and get some good uh, face cuts on the back so that it would, it would fit in there just right. Um, Fortunately, I had that. Unfortunately, it was just a little bit smaller diameter than I was really wanting. I, that's about eight and a quarter, or excuse me, eight and a half inches in diameter. I wish I'd had one that was about nine or even nine and a half inches to get those jaws out a little bit farther, but um, it, it's going to work just fine. 
So we're about ready to go. We'll go ahead and get the lathe uh, cranked up. We'll get the grinder cranked up. And uh, we're just going to feed this in and uh, make some light passes and uh, get those pads inside those jaws trued up uh, using the grinder. Uh, one question that someone asked me last time I did grinding is why do, do I grind this instead of just using a turning tool? And the reason is, is that these uh, jaws on the chuck are hardened, so you really can't use a, a carbide tool uh, or high-speed steel tool and go in there and, and cut it. Uh, to do a good job, you've got to go in there and grind it, which is why we have the tool post grinder uh, set up here. Okay, we're going to run the lathe at a fairly slow speed, uh, not too fast. And uh, let's see which way we're turning here. If you notice my wheel is turning opposite direction of the lathe, which is exactly what I want. I'm going to be cutting on the front side. I'll be feeding it to me. So the lathe is turning in one direction and the wheel is turning in the other. So we've got that going. I'm just going to real easily come up here and make sure that all right, we're not touching. I'm going to just feed all the way in there. touching anywhere so I'm good to go there all right I'm gonna just using my cross slide pull this out until it starts cutting all right you see it just kissing it's hitting one of the jaws now I'm just going to use my feed just like I was turning and that's going to slowly cut through there I've got you zoomed in close here. I want you to see. I got a little flashlight shining on there, and as I turn this, you can see the pads in there just shining, uh, which is exactly what I want. We have gone in and we basically have kissed each one of those with the uh, grinder, and now hopefully all of these teeth are the same diameter. And uh, when we chuck this piece back up and put our indicator on there, I'm expecting to see much less run out than we had before. So let's pull this ring off and uh, we'll get in here and get the indicator in there and see what it looks like. All right, we've got our piece of stock back in now and uh, the indicator on and moment of truth. Let's see how good it did. Okay, it looks like we still got some run out, uh, but we're down to about four thousandths, which for a uh, old three jaw chuck uh, isn't too bad sure beats the 17 thousandths we started with so we're going to call this job successful and uh, put a wrap on this <laughs>